Welcome to another edition of Wildcat Country. Eric Cohen and Shane Dale, and let's just get it out of the way. I mean, this show is not going to be the most fun show we've ever had. Uh, it was, this is probably of nearly 150 shows that Shane and I have done, easily the most disastrous uh, outcomes uh, that we could have ever, in it for all Arizona sports. I mean, baseball got swept by UCLA. The women are out. And I mean, obviously, we're going to talk about what happened with the men against Princeton a lot, Shane. Bruce Pascoe from the Arizona Daily Star going to join us. I'm going to call this a group therapy session because that's pretty much what this show is. Um, it's a rough one, Shane. Yeah, I was in my uh, office. Of course, I had one meeting during the first round of March Madness, and it was during this Arizona Princeton game, which probably ended. a good idea. Probably yeah. a good time. Well, for yeah, me. yeah. Well, I mean, I saw some texts from you about the game, which told me about what was going on. Uh, then I, I took a peek at the score, and all oh, Arizona's up 10. With uh, eight or nine minutes left. Okay, good. They're putting some separation. And then, I, of course, I completely forgot what Arizona does has done all year, which is play with their food and not make sure it's dead first. And mm-hmm. uh, took their foot off the gas and had a sloppy ending to that game. To a Princeton team that's apparently very, very good because they just blew up Missouri. Um, I'm sort of uh, – it, it, I'm at least 90% joking about that. But, look, I – let me just back up for a second. This team reminded me throughout the season and really toward the end of the season of Lou Dolson's 2001, 2002 team that lost four starters after going to the championship game the year before they added some key guys on that team to be sure with Chenny Fry and Sleep Stadamar, but they, what they lost definitely outweighed what they gained. They won the PAC 10 tournament at the time, got a three seed in the NCAA tournament, got to the sweet 16 before being destroyed by Oklahoma. They were never really a championship contender, even though they were sort of presented that way. And I feel like this was the same kind of team with Tommy Lloyd. Now, with that said, they should have at least gotten to the Sweet 16. I think that was probably their ceiling. Mm -hmm. Um, And they should have beaten Princeton, and they shouldn't have messed around and and, and allowed Princeton to hang around. I think this team lacked a a fire and one and i'll just mention this now i i i tweeted after the, the brackets came out and and people made their championship picks uh and all the espn people picked duke or whatever i said i'm thankful that no one's picking arizona to win the whole thing because i want them to go under the radar i want well, them to not read to their own press oh and, but the morning of the game the president of the united states well jay billis did Jay Billis and Dennis Dodd did. We talked okay, about it on the show. Just, uh, okay, but then, then the morning of the game, as they're getting ready, Joe Biden announces his picks, and Arizona's pick. He picks Arizona to win the whole thing, and I guarantee you that gets into Arizona's locker room. Now, I want to be clear: I'm not blaming the loss on Joe Biden. I'm just saying that for a team like this that tends to get complacent and tends to get bored and tends to be a little too bit too arrogant, that's like the last thing they needed. But I don't think it had anything to do. With I it. did. It didn't help. Okay, but but look, yeah. bottom, bottom line. This team was never a Final Four contender. They should have beaten Princeton. And thank goodness that uh, other teams stole the headlines in, in, in the next 24 hours or so. Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, I, I just don't think that – I don't think this team cared um, as to, you know, which – you know, who picked them or not. I don't think they, they cared that Jay Billis, Dennis Dodd, and – and Joe Biden picked oh, I him bet, to win. I bet they did. Kylan Boswell even retweeted one of the people who, uh, or quote tweeted one of the people who picked Arizona to win the whole thing. I oh, guarantee really? you, kid, they, oh, they I look did. at that stuff and they, they think, oh yeah, we're just as good as we as we think we are. Again, I, I, you, I, maybe, I, maybe we make too big a deal about the motivational stuff, but I really think this team lacked a fire and that kind of stuff didn't help. Well, That's I all. think, I think I mean, before we get into buy or sell, I'm just going to say this. I, I, I think they lacked an alpha. I think nobody yeah. wanted, uh, what I saw at the end of the game was that nobody wanted to take a shot. Yeah. And, and yeah. in a way, I saw the same thing in person against UCLA uh, on the previous Saturday, albeit Courtney Ramey stepped up and hit a big shot. Well, what, is down- it, what does everyone say? Great guard play. You have to have great guard play in the tournament. And Arizona had guys who could score 15 or 20 on a given night, but not one who can do it consistently. Not one but, who but, demanded the ball late in the game, except for maybe Kirk Carissa, who probably shouldn't demand the ball late in the game. But but it's also on Tommy Lloyd because Kylan Boswell could have been that guy. I mean, yeah. Kylan Boswell had turned yeah. into one of the best shooters on the team. I agree. And he only played, what, like 13 minutes? I agree. That and, was, and a, that was a, a misstep. That's, that's 100% on Tommy Lloyd. Don't give me this, well, he's a freshman 17 garbage. Like, he's one of your best players. You put him on the floor at the end of the game. Yeah. I'm sorry, but like Cedric Henderson wasn't hitting a big shot for you. He didn't. He didn't all year for U of A. Courtney yeah. Ramey did in the in the Pac-12 championship game. I think Tommy Lloyd failed uh, from a coaching perspective. I think uh, the players, the guys that were on the floor, got tight. I think they they yeah. they got real you know tight rear ends as as you know the expression goes. But you need someone who's going to take over a game late. And Tubelis, as great as he was all season, was not that guy. He was Arizona not the guy to take over two, late. Arizona had two guys last year who could have done that. 
uh, yeah. Ben Matherin and Dalen Terry. And if Dalen Terry had stayed, Arizona's probably still playing right now. And we're talking legitimate Final Four, as I said at the start of the year, because he wasn't afraid. Dalen Terry played with a cockiness that he wasn't afraid. Who on this team that you saw wasn't afraid? Yeah. Maybe Boswell, but we don't know because he wasn't in the I mean, game. Kirk Kreese is the only one, and he's and he's, and he's he was, like too much on the other afraid. side. Well, no, but he was afraid. Shane, he didn't. He wasn't taking big shots. He didn't want to be the guy that was going two for ten at the end of the game. You sometimes yeah. you just you got to trust yourself and fire. Ben yeah. Matherin didn't care. He uh, one of the. Yeah. Well, well, bottom line, Eric, is I think that this was a two seed that was really going into the tournament as a seven or an eight seed. That's probably no, how good. No, 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 no. That's probably about how good they were. Eric, you remember at the beginning of the season that they, they were fantastic. And then like Matt Bilbach told us a couple weeks ago, they sort of, you know, adjusted to, uh, to the mean, they went 14 and six in the pac 12, a great team does not go 14 and six in that crappy conference. You lose it at Stanford. You lose it home to ASU. You lose it home to Washington state. I know they won the pac 12 tournament. But that's because UCLA was hobbled. And they barely even even won it then. So I I, I think that I, I will defend Tommy Lloyd to the extent that I think he was a victim of his own of the team's own success during the regular season, especially in non-conference play. Going into the NCAA tournament, they were never a championship contender. Should they have beaten Princeton? Yeah. That was embarrassing, and it still is, and it will be for a while. Arizona's the only team now ever to lose to two 15 seats. Uh, but I my my attitude, Eric, is Final Four bus. It's been 22 years and counting, and if they don't get to the Final Four, then he might as I'm not saying he might as well lose in the first round, but it's just a disappointment. Uh, well, I'm going to bring that up because I, I somebody somebody made a point uh, that I want to. We'll talk about later in the show. My last thing before we get into buy or sell. This was not a seven or eight seed. This was a mm. team that I mean, you look at the wins that they've had: Creighton, San Diego mm. State, Tennessee, two over UCLA. Those teams right off the bat. Are still playing. No, uh, but none of them, because those were all three months ago, except for the UCLA game, which again was because they had two guys out. UCLA was the best team in the Pac-12. They yes. they they peaked the first half of the season. The yes. second half, if you just take the second half of the season, they probably go into the tournament okay. or seven or an eight seed. That's all okay. I'm saying. That's and that's all. Uh, you know, what? I'll give you that. I think that's a fair take. All right, let's get into buy ourselves presented by our friends at Ice Shaker. Uh, pretty cool. If you saw that, uh, and you'll see it during this the show as we go along. If you're watching on. Uh, on YouTube that Rob Gronkowski did a new ice shaker spot it was retweeted by one Jed fish uh, on yep. Sunday. So uh, pretty cool. Check that out. Ice shaker.com use promo code wildcat country, capital W capital C get $5 off your purchase there or go to fanatics.com and buy your ice shaker over there. Shane. Yeah. And, uh, and Rob uh, did a great ad for us. And I think he's a full-time employee now for his brother, Chris, who, uh, who founded the ice shaker went on shark tank, got a deal with a rod and Mark Cuban, and he's been rolling ever since. All right, buy or sell number one, Shane. This is the worst loss in Arizona basketball history. Buy or sell? Uh, you know, my when I saw this question from you, Eric, my, my first thought was, oh, what a hyperbole. But then I had to think, okay, what was worse? And I came up with Illinois in 2005, not only because they blew a late 15-point lead that would have gotten them to the Final Four, but considering what we know now, here we are in 2023, and they still haven't gotten back to the Final Four. How how depressing would that have been at the time to when know I, that? When, but when, when I say not most painful, I'm talking about because that was the most painful loss. We agree. Yeah. I'm talking about the actual worst loss. When you say Arizona lost to Washington State at home, that is a really bad loss. Yeah, yeah. Is this the worst? Now I think you have to go back to the 90s, Shane. I'm gonna say I'm gonna sell it because. There were some bad. I mean, Santa Clara wasn't good, and East there Tennessee were, think, State the year before that. Yeah, yeah, that wasn't good. Miami of Ohio was one in the nineties. That wasn't good. I mean, this is bottom five for sure. Maybe their most embarrassing tournament loss, if you want to put it that way, Eric. In terms of the fact that look, they lost to Princeton, and Princeton didn't even play that well. Princeton went four no. of twenty-five from three-point right. range. That was to me, it's not like the, a fifteen seed that played out of its mind for a game. Princeton didn't do that. Arizona just just choked it away and and they they did it almost nonchalantly and so that in that respect was it the most embarrassing loss maybe yeah I I'll, I'll give you that the worst loss to me the it, it would have to be the worst loss if it destroyed the program and it won't they'll be back right. next season so uh it, um, it's an interesting yeah. question I mean I'm interested to see or hear what other people think about this because it's one that you could you can definitely say it was the worst but I think in terms of yeah, you, know, you look at the program in the next couple of years. I don't think it's necessarily going to be, be remembered that way. Okay, uh, I'm going to group these next two questions together, Shane. Um, number two, Arizona under Tommy Lloyd cannot be trusted in the tournament anytime soon by yourself. 
It's way, way too early, way too early to say that. Uh, you know, you think back to, you know, Lute Olson is one of three head coaches ever, along with Matt Painter now is one of the other three. I don't remember the third one, but he's one of three coaches ever to lose to a 13 seed or worse three times in the tournament. And Lute is a god in Tucson because he got the four final fours and won a national title. We're very early in Tommy Lloyd's tenure. And let's be honest, again, like I said, this team was a two seed that was probably as talented as a seven or an eight going into the tournament. And again, I think it's more about players than coaches this time of year. I just do. So I'm upset about the result. It shouldn't have happened, but I think we need to give the man time. If it happens again next season, say they're a two or a three seed, they lose in the first or second round, or they just don't look like they're, they belong there, then I think we can have that discussion. But sometimes crap happens, and it happens in, in consecutive years. So you have to give Tommy Lee credit for what he did in the regular season. And if it happens again next year, I'm with you. But for now, I you know take it take a step back, take a deep breath and realize that this program is probably ahead of schedule under Tommy Lloyd and give another year or two to, to make a deep tournament run. If it happens next year and they go and they go to the final four in Glendale and all's forgiven. All right. I'm going to buy this one. I'm going to tell you why you're what? telling me next year when the NCAA tournament starts, I don't care if Arizona's 34 and 0 or whatever they are going into the tournament. You telling me you're not going to be nervous based on what we've seen from this team who in, in Tommy Lloyd's four tournament games, uh, over the last two years, has not played well. Oh, I mean, Eric, honestly, I'm always nervous. It's always well, but, but I'm season. saying, but I understand. Yeah, no, I understand. yeah, yeah. I mean, and, that, yeah. and that's where I look at this question. Yes, I mean, you. I'm going to be extra nervous. Simple yeah, the, it, Just, it, it's it's fair. It's fair because I guess the question is: Is it about the players or is it about the coach? Because you look back to last year, they how close did they come to getting bounced in the second round by an eight seed? Should have been. Uh, they should have been, and then they they yeah. lost the next game. And I think that was more of a matchup thing. So Houston was way underseeded. So I don't really criticize Tommy Lloyd for that, but they could have easily been gone uh, in round two, and then this year they they lose to a a fifteen seed that didn't play very well. So yes, it is a cause for concern. Yes, it'll be on my mind going into next year's tournament, especially if they're a high seed again, but I, I'm not saying that he's a bad tournament coach and always will be just because of these results. I'm not saying he always will be, but I'm just saying going into next year, you're darn right. I'm going to be apprehensive based on what we, what we've seen. Because Arizona flat, flat out has not played well in four games that he's coached in the NCAA tournament. They didn't play good against Wright state. They should have lost to TCU. They got smoked by Houston, honestly. And then they, they really got outplayed regardless of, I know what the score was a four point game, but like Arizona was really outplayed by Princeton. But again, you, you really could, wanted it more. You, you look at all the times that Arizona was a, was a top three or four seed under Lou Olson and how many times they got bounced in the first round or the second round of the tournament. And then even Sean Miller's yeah. tenure toward, toward the end, losing yeah. to Wichita state, losing to Buffalo, losing to a double digit seed in Xavier. Yeah. Uh, when they, in tw- last time the final four was out in Phoenix. So, you have to consider that as well. It's a small sample size. And I agree with it. Tommy Lloyd's made some mistakes late in games, you know, not missing that free throw intentionally against ASU, not putting Kylan Boswell in late. Those are on Tommy Lloyd. But as far as the mentality of the team and the overall performance of the team or, or you know, lack thereof in the tournament, to me, until further notice, it's still about the players. And I, I'll, I'll change my mind on that if I have to down the road. Number three, Tommy Lloyd has already shown that he will not win a national championship at Arizona. Way too soon. Way too soon. You, you get okay. on a hot streak. You just never know. And, and again, okay. going back to Lou Dolson, you know, they lose to a 14 seed in 92. They lose to a, a 15 seed in 93. Then they get to the final four the, the following year. Three years after that, they win the whole thing as a four seed. That's just the nature of, of the crapshoot of this tournament. Now, there are some coaches who consistently overachieve, like, you know, like Tom Izzo at Michigan State, Eric Musselman at Arkansas, another big mm-hmm. upset win yeah. for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, so maybe there is something to that. But to say – Definitively, he won't win a national championship. I think when you consider what Arizona has done in the regular season, and I, again, I'm sick of the regular season accolades. I want to get back to the Final Four as badly as every other Arizona fan does, but uh, way too soon to say he'll never win a title here. I agree. I'm going to sell that one. I just, uh, I mean, way too premature to say that. I think next year is, as you said, Shane, it's a big, it's a big step. You know, we we've talked about. I, I've said for a while, 24 is, is U of A's year. The Final Four is here. There's yeah. no reason. If Tabella stays, and we're going to talk about that next, that Arizona should not be in the Final Four. They still need an alpha. They need to find yeah. somebody who's maybe it's not enough. Even if they even if they bring back the same group, Eric, I don't think they're going to a Final you, Four. You, they, right. That you need somebody who's not afraid to take a shot. Yeah. I mean, I say the same group. Possible. We know. Yeah, we know we're losing Ramey and Henderson, so we know that. But the same core group. Uh, it's possible that all those guys who can return will return. But even with that, they 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 need some more help, especially on the guard side. All right, I'm gonna I'm we're we're gonna do this, Shane. Um, 
buy or sell whether you want them to come back or you think it's time for them to move on. Okay. okay. Uh, Azulis Tubelis, buy or sell. I want him to come back. I don't want. I don't want him to be the best player on the team next season. Okay. I way. will buy. I will buy that. And your explanation. I'll buy that. Umar Bala. Buy absolutely. All right. Yeah, we want him back. Uh, yes. Agreed. Uh, if he's the third or fourth best player on the team, great. Kirk Kreisa. Yeah, I want him back too. I, I know he could be a liability sometimes, but he's a great passer, and I, I think I, I think guys love playing alongside him. So no, I don't want him to be the guy, the guy to take the last second shot, but I, I would like to see him back. Yes. Okay. So here's where I'm going to say on this one. And there's been prevailing message board sentiment of this similar opinion. Okay. I am fine. If Kirk Kreese comes back, if he understands that he does, he is not an alpha and that he is more of a role player than a star on this team, that it's Kylan Boswell's team mm. and Kirk Kreese will play 20 plus minutes a game. But 30 plus minutes is far from a guarantee. If Kerr says, I need 30 plus minutes, see you later. That's, yeah. that is, that's my I, take. I, on. I understand that. But, you know, they played alongside each other uh, often toward the end of the season, Boswell but and, and Kreese. I, I don't, Kirk Kreese is not a good defender. Yeah. Uh, and, and we know his shooting. But, I mean, when he goes two for 10, Arizona loses. It's, Look, it's I, I, I've complained about Kirk Kreese's up and down uh, mentality more often than, than just about anyone. But the guy led the Pac 12 in assists, he can pass the ball. Uh, but I don't want him. I don't want him as Arizona's primary ball handler yeah. next year. I want Kylan Boswell as that guy. I'm just saying he's 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 a good passer. He's a good ball handler. So well, I understand I, what you're saying, and there could be it could be a tricky situation there. But uh, I would like to see him back. I understand Pella, what you're saying though. Pella Larson. Yeah, um, I, it's kind of the same thing with him. You know, as if he's happy to be a role player, maybe a guy who comes off the bench again. That seemed to be a better fit for him. Yeah. Um, I guess it depends like if it, if it's at the expense of a, a transfer who could, you know, be their leading scorer then no, but I don't think it's going to come down to that. So I would like to see him back. Yes. I would like to see him back uh, very much. So, so I know you're more lukewarm on it. Like I, I want to see Pella come back. I think Pella can be an impact player off the bench or, you know, as a sixth man, maybe as that fringe starter, like, I, I mean, Pella Larson is a better player than Cedric Henderson. Yeah, but and, he just didn't play well as a starter. But he and I did like that he got more aggressive as the season went on, and I think he kind of had to. I think Tommy Lloyd challenged him too because he wasn't shooting well from three for most of the year, even though he he can be a very good three point shooter. But he would take it to the hoop. He would get some dunks. I mean, we forget the end of that ASU game in Tucson. He made a layup that put Arizona ahead and probably and should have won the game for them. And that's all we've been talking about, if, if right. not for the 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 sixty footer at the end of the game. So he got more aggressive toward the end of the year. He he rounded out his game. Uh, a bit. He's a good defender. You want him on the court late in games. He's a good free throw shooter usually. So yeah, I would definitely like to see him back. Uh, number five, Shane, it was kind of a relief when Purdue and, and ASU lost. Like, I, it yeah. made me feel better as yes. awful as that is to say. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as far as ASU is concerned, I mean, that would have been a disaster if ASU had gone further than Arizona. Yeah, I mean, you hear the end it of it beyond, the, beyond the, yeah. the sixty footer and McHale on senior yeah. day, and then you, they go further in the tournament. Yeah, oh, you won't disaster. hear the end of it. And then, uh, so yes, yeah, so that, that I I did enjoy that, admittedly. And then uh, Purdue losing to FDU definitely took some of the heat off of. Uh, oh yeah, off of uh, Arizona. So yes, what did I, did I tell it. you about Purdue? Every you, did, you nailed it. Year. You nailed it. But now you talk about guys who underachieve in the tournament. Oh, yeah. Matt. Every year, I Man. told you, Matt Painter. There is something to that, yeah. His last two years, Shane, he's been bounced by St. Peter's and FDU. Think about that. Yeah, that is rough. In, I don't care that you were number one in the country. That is a fireable offense. Like, so, yeah, someone that, tweeted out that that um, the teams that, that don't start the year in the top 25 and, end as, yeah. and go in as a one or a two seed have horrible luck in the tournament. And this step, it was, it, well, yeah, well, right. And then it was uh, Purdue and Marquette. Yep. This year, and neither team got to the Sweet 16. So interesting, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, and I was and I was a buyer on Marquette. Now knowing that stat, good to know for the future. Yep. But I, I will say this: if I were per, a Purdue fan, I'd be calling for Matt Painter's head. I don't care what. At some point, the regular season doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. And I want to I'm going to bring that br bring that back here in a second. Um, but I want to talk about the women's team for a second because they had a great win against West Virginia mm -hmm. uh, on Friday. Unfortunately, you know, they were winning at halftime on Sunday against yeah. uh, Maryland and then fell apart in the second half. But number six, Shane, unlike the men's team, the women's team has absolutely nothing to be ashamed of as far as their tournament performance. 
I'll take more of a macro view on this and I'll buy it just because you think about where this program has come from, from five years ago to an absolute dumpster fire of a program yeah. Nadia Barnes took over to winning, um, what, seven tournament games in the last three years. They've gotten out yeah. of the first round in three straight years. When has Arizona ever done that? When have they been that relevant? So it, it, it was a bit of a disappointment the way they ended the season and they had a chance to host and see a tournament game and then they fell apart late. But you know they, they went on the road and across the country and beat West Virginia. Uh, they gave Maryland a hard time for for a half. Maryland's one of the best teams in the country, so it is what it is. But yeah, it I proud of them. Um, it, it, it they're just they're not the men's team. They don't have that pedigree. So what Adia Barnes has done is you know like Tommy Lee can go out and say we're Arizona. We're we're, you know, we're a big brand on the women's side. Adia Barnes hasn't had that, and he's, he's still been able to sell top recruits. He's got a great class coming in next season. It's going to be a shame to see uh, Kate Reese and Shana Pellington finally mm-hmm. move on, but yep. uh, and Jade Laville as well. Yep. But I think they're going to reload, and, and they could be. There should be relevant in the Pac-12 uh, indefinitely as long as Adia Barnes is there. So uh, disappointing ending to the season, I guess, uh, in terms of they they could have been seated higher and they could have maybe gone been a little more competitive. But macro view, the the last three years, it, it's been a revelation for for the women's basketball team and a program that should stay competitive as long as Adia Barnes is there. All right, bonus question number one is I got a few of them for you. Um, I asked you this something similar last week. Which coach do you trust more building the program going forward? Tommy Lloyd or Adia Barnes? Um, I, 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 Adia Barnes, I think is probably a better, you're, you're enjoying watching me squirm over this it is, is probably a better overall recruiter just because she's uh, considering like what I just said, you know, the sure. Arizona women's mm-hmm. brand is just not anywhere close to what the men, men's brand is. Correct. Um, but with that that pedigree and Tommy Lloyd being able, he, he's a good recruiter as well. He was a great recruiter at Gonzaga, and he and he's going to do so here. Um, long, if you're asking who I think is a better chance of winning a championship in the next few years, I think it's still the men. Uh, in terms of an actual recruiter and and building a, a program, maybe it's Adia because she's done more with less. I would agree with that. Number bonus question number two, and I'm not even getting to the good one yet. After watching Shane, a you know the the Princeton performance in Sacramento. Has it changed your tune? Like, you know, how I felt always that the the women get it right. Women's basketball gets it right in that the top four seats host on their home court. Is it time for the men to do this? We need to reward regular season success. I know people love upsets, but at some point when, you know, Arizona playing in Sacramento is really not that big of an advantage for their regular season success. Yeah. Uh, I, number one, I don't think you, you have, to, you should have to depend on that. If you're a great team, they should have beaten Princeton without it. But I, so that that's number one. And number two, playing at home doesn't guarantee you're going to advance. I mean, Arizona no. last year and Stanford, number one, see Stanford loses to old miss, uh, on In the women's on Sunday, you're right. So. But uh, it gives him a better chance. I mean, you're, you're, there, yeah. there's going to be an upset chain. I mean, Indiana just went down at home in the, on the women's seed, uh, women's side to Miami and yeah. they were one seed at home. Right. I'm just saying. I don't see why I, I don't understand, especially for fans too, to travel three straight weekends, to different places like that's, that's hard for a fan to do. I mean, if Arizona was playing at McHale center in the first two rounds, you and I would definitely think about being there. It would be super mm-hmm. exciting. And we're not traveling to Sacramento. No. And I was looking at the regional sites, the upcoming ones. I mean, there's nothing, you know, that I, I understand that the West is in, you know, LA and, and, you know, I think it's in, you know, Denver again. Like there, there's nothing that is easy to drive to yeah. as far as the first and second round games. If you're an Arizona fan until 2026, when San Diego's back there. But you know, what's interesting, Eric, is a, a lot of times it, it's more of a home court advantage in the, uh, the regional, like the, the regional semifinal right. and the regional final, like because if Arizona was to play in- travel, well, if it, and if Arizona was to go to Las Vegas, you'd have tons of fans there again. You know, and a lot of times, like in the Midwest region, you know, Kansas gets to play in Kansas City, and 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 so sometimes it evens out that way. But you know, I I, I get what you're saying. I I is it going to happen anytime soon? Hell no, because people love this tournament format. But I, I I don't think it I don't think it should matter. I mean, the the fact that you don't have to play another true road game the rest of the season to me is is reward enough. Okay, uh, here's the other bonus question that I've wanted to get to. Um, I had a friend who gave me this opinion uh, right after the game on Thursday. I, I personally, I'll give you my opinion on it. I want to see if you will buy or sell. This person, good good friend of mine, and and I appreciate what they were trying to do, uh, was said this. 
I I would rather see Arizona win in the regular season and win the Pac-12 tournament and and lose earlier on than have a mediocre regular season, a mediocre uh you know Pac-12 tournament not win it and then lose heartbreakingly before the final four. This person was at the Pac-12 tournament. So they got a chance to enjoy that that victory in person. They said, "Hey, I got a chance to soak that in." And, you know, it's better at least my heart's not getting ripped out in the Elite 8 again. It's a long-winded way of saying, yeah. you know, what he said in the text. Do you buy or sell that argument? I'll, I'll buy in the sense that to me, like I said, it's Final Four or bust, and I'm sick of losing in the Elite Eight. Arizona's lost in the Elite Eight five times since they got to the Final Four last, and several of those have been in heartbreaking, gut-wrenching fashion. So I understand that. I've been part of the Pac-12 tournament. Like I was a member of the media in 2017, which was Larry Markinen's year when Arizona won it. And, um, you know, I was down on the floor, you know, taking photos and video and not officially celebrating, but, you know, being part of the, con- you know, the confetti coming down and watching them cut down the net was was an awesome experience. So. I understand that mentality. I, I thought you were going to say that he would rather have a great regular season than go to the final four, which had been crazy. No, no, no. But, no. It's, it's- but that's actually a valid point. Uh, and that it, it's nice. Like I, if Ari- I don't like saying that. I guess it makes me a bad fan, but if Arizona is going to lose, I kind of rather they lose early before we get our hopes up and think final four, because to me, a final four has become that Holy grail again, that like, even though Arizona has been there four times, it's been half a lifetime, literally for me. Right. So uh, you know what? I'll, I'll go ahead and, and and buy that. It's like at least we can have the regular season success. I guess on the on the downside is that that regular season success gets you excited for the postseason and for the NCAA tournament, and that the possibilities open up, and then you realize that you know here we are sitting at home talking about a uh, a loss to Princeton. So I understand both sides of the argument, but uh, I'll 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 buy the mentality. I guess I, I want to apologize to my friend uh, who is listening to this podcast um, where I criticize this opinion. I thought it was ridiculous. I thought it's, there would be nobody. I, I, to me, I, I, I don't care about the Pac-12 tournament. I mean, listen, did I want to lose to ASU? No. But if you're going to tell, I would rather Arizona get to the Elite Eight every single year over win the Pac-12 tournament. Even if I'm there, I would rather they get yeah. there and give me the hope. I mean. Yeah. Hope is cruel. I, as an Arizona, I, you, not just a U of A sports fan, but Suns, Cardinals, D-backs, Coyotes. Hope is a is a cruel mistress, but, Eric. I, but Shane, there is nothing like the the hope that you know maybe this is the year that Arizona gets gets over yeah. the hump, and yeah. I want that excitement again. I want you and I to be doing an emergency podcast before the Elite Eight and talking no. about all right, what's going to happen? Well, we do this I'm long sorry. enough, then that's bound to happen. But yeah, well, I, well, get, but I get it. So I, I appreciate you're taking that viewpoint. I apologize to my friend who's listening to this. I have very mixed feelings about it, but I think it is a perfectly valid perspective. And there you go. Let's find out. Speaking of perfectly valid perspectives, let's talk to Bruce Pasco of the Arizona Daily Star. He always gives us a uh, an honest perspective here on Wildcat Country. What's up, Wildcat Country? It's Robbie G, baby, and I am gearing up for a big year with Coach Jet Fish and excited to see what the Arizona Wildcats do this football season. And just like the football team, we stepped up our program as well with the official licensed U of A ice shaker, baby. Check it out and get it at fanatics.com. Bear down, Arizona. Let's go. Well, it's time for the second segment of our group therapy session, and uh, there's nobody who is uh, better to tell us the truth as to what happened and what things look like going forward than the ace reporter for the Arizona Daily Star, Bruce Pasco. Bruce, thank you for joining us. I know you have some extra time uh, now that, uh, you know, there have been, uh, it was an earlier exit than expected. I-, I guess the first question is, what happened in your opinion? Well, I, you know, I mean, a kind of a combination of things. This, I mean, I go back to October. I didn't think this team would – I thought it had a lot of weaknesses, didn't go too deep. I mean, just losing three guys in the NBA is tough to come back for. I think expectations got raised really high when they went to Maui, and then they did really well. They beat Indiana and Tennessee, and all of a sudden everybody's thinking this is a Final Four team. You know, they certainly had that potential. They could, you know, impress the thing. They could win in a lot of different ways. But they never were that deep, and you know. And then I, and then I think you saw uh, some slippage there. You know, losing those two games at home was probably the toughest thing. Uh, you know, Washington State and and then ASU on that shot. Uh, you know, where they pro- probably shouldn't have been in a position like that. 
uh, to even lose that kind of game. And, you know, and then I, and then, you know, on top of it, I think ultimately basically the PAC 12 term just kind of wiped them out, you know, hurt those two key guys, Creesa and Ballo. And, uh, you know, that was just too much to overcome. And, you know, I think they might, they should have certainly been able to beat Princeton and probably Missouri was even a better matchup, but I, I didn't think this team, the way it was going would last past uh, three rounds or so. Uh, I'm with you on that, Bruce. I was tempted to pick him to lose in the second round. I did think they get yeah. past Princeton, though. Uh, I, 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 something I've mentioned a couple of times this, this season, Bruce, uh, is I feel like this team they, they play with their food too much. In, in other words, they they took some teams lightly. They coast a little bit when they get ahead. We saw that against ASU. They're up ten with yes. five minutes left against Princeton. They go up ten. They're probably thinking, okay, we're good. And then Princeton yes. makes its run, and all of a sudden they find themselves down by a point in the final minute. What are your thoughts on that? Right. That's exactly right. Then you get, and especially when it's a tournament game, you they start to come back and then you're like, Oh geez, you know? And, and I think we saw that and they got nervous and, and kind of, you know, it was tough down the stretch. They had six turnovers in the last uh, 10 minutes. Um, I think they missed the last six or seven shots. They were three, 14 in the last 10 um, just, you know, kind of a meltdown, frankly. And, but I think it, it, yeah, I think Shane, we honestly saw that trend back when they lost to Utah, December one, they come off of Maui, they're flying high. Everything's great. Uh, you know, super confident. And I think maybe, you know, maybe they, they suffer from their own sort of publicity machine around them. Uh, there's so much buzz and hype around this program that when they do well, everybody's riding high and they go up to Utah, you know, pretty tough team, very tough environment, high altitude um, and just got smacked. And, and then I think, uh, and then you get into the round new year's and they're coming high off of those Indiana, Tennessee wins thinking everything's good and boom, Washington is leading by 14 points in the first half at McHale, you know, and that wasn't enough of an alarm clock. If, if that wasn't enough of an alarm clock, they lose to Utah state two or you Washington state two days later. So they just, unfortunately for them, didn't, didn't really learn that lesson. You've got to keep your foot on this accelerator. So through two seasons, Tommy Lloyd's done a fantastic job with this team in the regular season and the Pac-12 tournament, NCAA tournament. There's been, uh, as we say in the corporate world, opportunities. Uh, does, it's such a small sample size. Do you, do you feel like it's a, more about coaches during the tournament or about players and the, the players just didn't get it done versus Tommy Lloyd maybe not being a great tournament coach? Well, I mean, I think strategically he's a good coach. Developmentally, the guys are getting better. Uh, you know, you could argue that, you know, and I think he said, hey, I'm still growing as a coach. Well, that was a you know pretty good admission. Maybe maybe he needs to light a little bit more of a fire. I think some coaches and, and Lou Olson was kind of like this, kind of felt like, hey, it's the tournament. You should light your own fire. But, you know, they're, they're 19, 20, 20-year-olds. 20 they still they, – and they're human. I mean, you know, some of that can be good. I think maybe they were uh, just a little a little too light there and – you know, maybe you could, maybe you could fault him for that. Um, I, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's hard to say, but the, the players too should probably have some of that in them, you know, naturally. And uh, I think maybe, you know, that was the one thing we've talked about you guys, you know, this, the one thing this team kind of lacked was that Ben Matherin kind of guy who was, you know, when they had that situation against TCU, remember they were kind of floating around TCU, they were in, and then all of a sudden they were in trouble. Ben Matherin took the ball and he just made it happen. And th there wasn't anybody on this team. And Tubelis tried to do that, but, you know, he's a different kind of player and they really did a good job of hounding him. So, you know, there was nobody there to ring the bell at, or whatever you want to call it at the end. And then that, that, that hurt him. Yeah, Bruce, I would call that an alpha. I think, I think that's one yeah. thing that I saw that Arizona was missing was they didn't have that alpha this year. And if Dale and Terry had stayed, he would have been that guy. Yeah. How easy do you think it will, or, or hard do you think it would be it will be for Tommy Lloyd to find one in the off season, or is there already one on the roster? Well, I think you look at it and you probably think Kylan Boswell has got the most upside to develop into that. He could be a scoring point guard who really could take it over. And he will, unlike to he will have the ball in his hands and can do that. And I think, you know, if you project the curve of how good he was towards the end of this year, start compared to where he started out in his age and, you know, um, there's upside there for him to become that kind of player. Now he may be, he may only be around another year, but maybe he, you know, in the one year he could develop into that. Uh, you know, I definitely can see that happening. You know, we'll see who comes up in the grad transfer market. It's possible they have a guy like that, but that's a difficult thing to mix in a grad transfer to be that alpha. Uh, you know, you can really mess around with your chemistry when that happens. And I think, you know, the two guys he brought in this year, grad transfers kind of mix pretty well. You know, certainly Henderson did and, and Ramey eventually did. And, 
Um, but, um, but neither one of those were kind of that kind of guys either. They were, you know, kind of, in fact, Ramey played his best when other things weren't going well and kind of was just supplemental in some ways. And, and, uh, so yeah, basically to long answer your question, I think, I think, uh, you know, Basel is the best answer. Maybe he finds somebody out there in the grad transfer market, or maybe there's a, a European under a rock somewhere, but that's usually a guy that's going to take some developing like, like Henry Vaso, you know. Let's talk about our favorite topic, and that's roster transition uh, going forward. Who do you not expect to be back outside? I mean, just your personal opinion. I know it's early. Outside of Ramey and Henderson, who are gone, we know that. Yeah. Who would you be surprised if they came back? Well, honestly, nobody. But, you know, I say that in this day and age, that's a really dangerous thing to say because guys just go if they're if it's even a close call. I think more likely than not, Tabellis leaves, especially, you know, he he has a lot of options. Uh, you know, he can go back to Europe and sign for quite a bit of money or he can go to probably command a uh, maybe a second round pick and or a two way contract where you can make five hundred thousand now. There's also the possibility, though, that, you know, he's a really loyal guy. He likes it here. There's a possibility if he gets enough NIL money, maybe he comes back and, and works on his game even more and tries to become a first round pick. He's not a first round pick now. And I know his goal is to make the NBA. And so he needs to decide where is it best for me to develop. Uh, and, and maybe the answer is here. So it's not out of the possibility he comes back. I, you know, um, I think I think Parisa will be interesting because, you uh, you know, whether he wants to come back and kind of share the backcourt with Boswell, who's clearly developing into a, you know, a top shelf point guard. And, and they could do that, you know, in Tommy Lloyd's system, they could play two point guards. It wouldn't be, you know, they, they, you know, more so than, than him, than Chris and Ramey would be those two guys. And that could work, but Chris may decide maybe he wants to go back to Europe and, uh, you know, play on a, on a second tier team there and work his way up. I mean, he's, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see. And then I think, you know, those developmental guys face are indicated the other day when I talked to him, he seems to like to want to give it another shot and learn what he needs to learn. I think for from what I understand is the same way. I think he knew going in, it was going to take him some time. So I think probably the only other guy you could maybe say might be a question mark would be Adama ball because he didn't play a lot and it's been two years and he hasn't really cracked that rotation. So does he look for another place to make that happen or does he go home to, to Europe and, and, uh, and just, just make his mark there. First, my last question for you. It seems like there's more parity in the NCAA tournament than there used to be. You know, it's the second time in like four or five years we've had a 16 beat a one. Third straight year, a 15's beaten a two. Do you, do you think that that gap between the one and the 16 C, the two and the 15 is just smaller than it used to be? Well, it certainly has in the last, yeah, 10 to 12 years. It, it has. I think that's a function of guys having left early frankly and you know so you're you know you're getting these teams like princeton that are uh you know got a lot of juniors and seniors and aren't and they can beat a talented team of you know, freshmen and sophomores and you know that are trying to you know create chemistry and rhythm even though they're more talented you know a lot of those times those older teams have an advantage and i think sean miller's got one of those teams or a lot of juniors and seniors there at xavier and he just kind of uh, you know, got him to buy into his style and that that's working. And, and, but yeah, on a lower level, you're seeing that with, with 15s and 16s more often. What'll be interesting, Shane, I think is, does that trend maybe reverse a little bit now? If the NIL money comes in, we saw Oscar Sheboy came back to Kentucky, maybe Tobellus comes back because he gets money here. And uh, you know, that could, that could kind of create uh, power with the blue bloods who have NIL collectives of real, uh, you know, real, you know, that can pay guys a hundred thousand a year or plus, then maybe the changes the other direction, especially a guy like Shibwe, uh, you know, who wasn't going to be an NBA player necessarily can come back and arguably make more money in college. I mean, that's a really, we're in a really weird time of transition. It could really be interesting to see what happens. All right, Bruce, my final question. And I also want to focus on next year as of right now, just what, whatever you expect to happen in the off season, what is your, expectation for the 23 24 arizona team considering the final four is in glendale is a, is this a final four team if tubelis comes back uh is it i mean just what what do you look at going forward i know there's a lot that can change but just for now yeah i mean if he comes back absolutely i mean they they you know 
and they got and they then i think you know guys are typically getting better in this program so you know i mean you know, look at the, the you know, larson got better this year as it went on uh umar balo kind of you know he kind of leveled off but he played at a really high level and then he, he got the you know infection in early january and then he got the the broken hand at the end so it, he, you can't really look at that but you know most for the most part guys are getting better and you know if he brings in a couple of good complementary pieces like he did last year on the grad transfer market i think there's going to be at least one international guy you know he may only need three new guys you know he may only have room for three three or maybe four at the most so yeah i, I think so it's just but tabellus is a real key to that and and yeah lane and glendale that that would be something else if they you know, they somehow can get there. I mean, we, we all thought about that in 2017 and, you know, uh, Miller had them lined up to stay in the West. And then of course they lost that sweet 16 game, but you never know. I could, it, 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 they definitely could be considered. I think if, I think if Tubelis comes back, we're looking at a, you know, top five preseason team and, um, and they definitely would be considered. For it. All right. I got one last bonus question for you. Tommy Lloyd, would, do you trust him in the tournament going forward? Doesn't matter what Arizona does before then. The first game, whoever Arizona plays next year, do you in your mind have doubts based on what we've seen thus far from Tommy Lloyd coaching in the tournament? Well, I think it's reasonable to ask that question, but I think, you know, I think he's, I, I think he's strategically and games, game planning and stuff. I think it's pretty good. It's just a matter of does he need to light a fire again more under these guys a little more? You know, I, I think you remember, you know, are they tense for some reason? If you remember even that Wright State game in the first round last year, they they struggled at times in that game. And I remember Lloyd was kind of frustrated that fans weren't noisier. Everybody was expecting 16 to 1 in that game that they, they wouldn't be a problem. The fans were just kind of sitting there on their hands. And, uh, you know, maybe there's something there lacking a little bit. But I think, you know, if, I think for the most part, it's it's a little too early to say. I think, you know, one thing you say what you want about Sean Miller, but he – generally had his guys ready you know they generally didn't get upset until it got to the point where there was the buffalo game that was you know when things were just going wiggy with the whole program in general but before then they generally didn't get upset you know those two wisconsin games they were one two games both years i think um and you know lloyd's a little it's a little too early to tell i think you know but i think you, you definitely have to you have to wonder i think maybe next year if we see this happen again then you're definitely asking that question for sure you know, you're always honest, Bruce. We really appreciate you joining Shane and I. You tell it like it is, and uh, we're grateful to have you on. And I'm sure, considering all of the roster potential transition this offseason, we'll be talking to you here again soon. Yeah, anytime. Yeah, anytime, guys. I mean, we'll see. Things could look a lot different in about six weeks, for sure. One gem mint PSA 10 after another. That's what so many card collectors, including yours truly, have experienced when they submit their cards for grading through DT Sports Cards. They are an authorized PSA dealer, which means if you submit your cards through them, you'll reap all the benefits of being a PSA subscriber without actually having to subscribe. That means you can take advantage of PSA's bulk submission rate, even if you want to submit just a single card. And for just $2 a card, DT Sports Cards will give your cards a thorough review and tell you if they're likely to receive your desired grades for them. I've submitted baseball, football, basketball, hockey, and yes, even Pokemon, and have received so many PSA 10s because DT Sports Cards has helped me send in the right cards and save my money on the rest. Check them out for yourself at DTSportsCards.com or on Twitter and Instagram at DT underscore sports cards. All right, Shane, great to talk to Bruce Pascoe. Always uh, appreciate his opinions. But uh, let's talk about some good news. Delaney Schnell, national champion diver. She already has, I believe, a silver medal in the Olympics. I think it was a now bronze. She's a bronze My, medal. Now I she's a so. national champion. Yeah, How about that? outstanding. outstanding. Uh, great news in, this, in a sea of uh, not so pleasant news. So congratulations to her. Uh, we got to have her on the podcast at some point. Why haven't we yeah. had her on yet? We, we do need to have her on. She is a continual bright spot for this university and the athletic department. So congratulations to Delaney. Baseball team got swept by UCLA. We're just going to sweep that under the rug. Softball team uh, lost two out of three to Utah. At crazy home. games. Yeah. And big, last big weekend for big weekend for baseball play ASU. Uh, gotta, gotta win this series up here in the Phoenix area. Uh, you can't lose six straight or five out of six. Uh, or whatever it turns out to be, this is a big weekend for the baseball team. Yeah, got to no say doubt. that. No doubt. All right, let's let's make a couple of picks, Shane. Uh, unfortunately, Arizona is not uh, in this 
bracket here. We're just going to go fairly quickly here. Give me your four final four teams as of right now. Has anything changed? Um, let's start with it. Let's start in the in the uh, Arizona's region of the South, Alabama. Do you think Alabama makes the final four? Or they get tripped up by Creighton. Or, I uh, I uh, I had Creighton before the tournament started. I'm going to stick with them. I don't see any reason to change that now. I think Alabama has looked the best, uh, so I'm going to stand by uh, them, and I think they're going to make the final four. That's fair. Uh, how about uh, Houston? Houston was down ten at halftime on Saturday, and then. Uh, outscored Auburn like 50 to 23 in the second half. They showed they belong. Yeah. Does Texas win that region in a surprise or is this Houston, you know, getting to play on their, in, in the final four in their home city? Yeah. Well, spoiler Houston's my pick to win the whole thing, but here, here's a, a semi bold prediction. Uh, if, if Houston ends up playing Texas and, you know, Sean Miller and Xavier will probably win that region because F my life. But if, if it's Houston and, and, and Texas, I predict the winner of that game would the national championship. How's that? Okay. That's fair. But I, I think I, I, I'm still I'm still riding with Houston. Okay, uh, let's go to the West region, which two games I really think are fascinating. I actually want to yeah. pick both these games: Arkansas, UConn, and then Gonzaga, UCLA. Just kind of your rationale for both of those games. Uh, UConn, I think, is is back in the early season form when they were in the top five. Uh, I don't remember how high they were ranked, but they look great. Uh, the uh, number two, I think, Dan- Danny Hurley's got his team rolling. Uh, and then I, I think UCLA is probably a little bit better than Gonzaga, but UCLA is still hobbled. Um, I think the Zags, uh, they, they've started off slow in both their games. They were behind to GCU late in the first half, and they rolled in the second half. They, they came from behind against TCU. I think they probably do the same thing against UCLA. So I'm thinking UConn, UCLA, in the, or I'm sorry, UConn and Gonzaga in the Elite Eight. And who do you like to, who do you like to come out of that? I think UConn's rolling right now. I'm going to go with them all the way to the Final Four. So I'm picking uh, I'm picking UConn over Arkansas, but it's not a, a guaranteed pick. Eric no. Musselman's coached. Uh, this is third year at Arkansas, two elite eights. I yep. mean, if anybody knows how to win this game, it's Musselman. He is the yeah. definition, like Tom Izzo, of an overachiever head coach in the tournament. Uh, does it, you know, seemingly every year. Uh, so I, I'm going to go with UConn, but it's it's not a confident pick. And I actually like UCLA, Shane. I'm going the other way there, too. I expect UCLA to try to slow Gonzaga did down like St. Mary's did. And like UCLA did to Arizona. Now, UCLA lost both of those low-scoring games to Arizona. I think they win a, a low-scoring, fun game, though, against Gonzaga. I'm re- This is the one game I'm really, really excited to see. Uh, and then in the other region, I actually picked Florida Atlantic in the Sweet 16. They play Tennessee. And then you've got uh, on the bottom there with Marquette out, it's Michigan State and Kansas State, who I don't think much of. Who comes out of that region, Shane? I think the K-State-Michigan State winner goes to the Final Four. Uh, I'm going to roll with Michigan State just because, too. Of, Tom, because of Tom Izzo. He, he talk about great, great tournament coaches. You know, Every co- great coach has had a slip up here and there, but Tom Izzo is one of the best in March. Can you imagine if, you're, if your Final Four actually happens and it's a Creighton-Michigan State national semifinal? Yeah. I mean, that would be... I mean, you would have a powerhouse one with Houston, uh, Houston or Texas versus, you know, UConn or, or UCLA or Gonzaga. I mean, that's a that's a monster one. But then on the other side, if you had Creighton and Michigan State, I mean, oh, my God, if Michigan State makes a title game, I'm just going to shake my head. Uh, Tommy Lloyd needs to go to Tom Izzo camp of how to win in the tournament. Well, that's do you remember you remember a few years back when was it the seven seed UConn played eight seed Kentucky in the championship yeah. game? Yeah, so you just never know. Uh, but yeah, as of now, my revised bracket, I've got Houston over Michigan State in the championship game. Wow, I'm sticking with Houston over Alabama. That's what I've had. My all my brackets are not yet busted. Good. I should have stuck with Air, with Creighton over Arizona in the Sweet 16, which I had, and then I changed my mind last week after we made our picks. Um, yeah. Disappointed. That it's another I, example of why hope is such such a bad bad thing. Well, guys, look at it this way. You know, Shane, <laughs> it's, it, the shows aren't going to get much worse than this. This is painful. Hopefully. Oh, you shouldn't have said that, Eric. No, no, I won't be. And we'll talk, you know, we got baseball and, and softball to talk about. Football's in uh, in spring camp, so we got a lot to talk about, and we'll have some guests on. And a Pac-12 TV deal if that ever happens. If that ever happens. I'm sure we'll have people to chat about that as well. So thanks to Bruce Pasco for joining us. For Shane Dale, I'm Eric Cohen. Thank you for joining our group therapy session as to uh, Arizona's losses this past week. I'm Eric Cohen. Uh, thanks for listening. And as always, bear down. Bear down.